So welcome back. I think uh, everything seems to be up and running now. Uh, I thank you so much for joining us today, uh, taking your valuable time out. And I hope I will be able to add some value to all of you in terms of getting a good understanding of Babok. Uh, I have been studying Babok for more than 12 years now. So first time I came across Babok, it was version two and the year was 2012. Uh, when I was planning to take my CBAP exam. Over a period of time, Babok has changed. Uh, so it is a new version now, uh, which is 3.0. And my understanding of Babok also has evolved over a period of time. Uh, many of you may know me. Uh, my name is Ellen Mishra. I'm the principal trainer and business analyst at Adaptive US. Uh, I have been performing this role for more than 25 years now. So the first business analyst role I played was in the year 1996. So that's about exactly about 26 years from today, 26, 27 years. Uh, and I'm also the first business analyst in the world to complete all seven IIBA certifications. And I have mentored, guided more than 1900 BAs to get IIBA certified. So hopefully I'll be able to answer most of your queries on the topic. So let's get going and let me ask one simple question. Uh, so where are you guys joining from? Anybody from Africa, Europe, anybody from Australia? That would be really interesting to see. So where are you from? Many of you may be from US, I would believe so, uh, because this is timed pretty well for US, Canada as well. Uh, but other than US, Canada, any other country we have here today? Okay, Australia. Wow. Actually, there is somebody from NSS has been a very strong supporter of our webinars. Thank you, NS, for joining. Uh, Nikhat is from London. Okay. Uh, Amir is from South Africa. Sam is from NYC. Oh. Lucas is from Warsaw. Okay, Naman is from India. Wow, South Africa, Bangalore. Wow, I think we seem to be covering quite a good number of continents. Um, so we have Africa covered, Europe covered, North America covered, uh, Australia covered as well, Asia covered, so that's nice. Anybody from South America? Yeah, that's one continent I don't see much people joining. And that has been a strange thing for me because is it language? Oh, there is somebody from Peru. Wow. Wow, Roboto. Uh, good. Emerson. Oh, hi, Emerson. Good to see you here. Okay. Emerson happens to be one of our past students. Um, so some of you are um, from the part of adaptive family itself. Good. Thank you. And I'm glad so many of you have taken time and come here today. And I am quite hopeful and I would make my best efforts to make sure that you find certain value and move ahead in your business analysis career. That has been our motto in terms of helping business analysts do win their profession. Um, they should earn more. They should feel more confident about their work, uh, get better respect um, in the community, and of course, get themselves certified as a business analyst. So the intent of this webinar is actually to demystify Babok for you uh, because Babok is a very large document and it's a little hard to understand Babok without a context. And that's what I'm trying to do today to give you a context around Babok so that when you read Babok, it becomes a lot easier for you to grasp what it is trying to communicate because I actually took quite a long time to grasp Babok Although I could pass CBAP uh, without a proper understanding of ABAP, but I think maybe that time CBAP wasn't that hard and not many people were going for CBAP. So that's probably why it wasn't that hard a challenge for me. But even then I had prepared for more than six months uh, before going for CBAP. And I would keep about 30 minutes of time for you to ask me questions. Uh, because that's what I believe would add a lot of value to you. Just me talking about some topics which I've been doing and teaching for a long time may not be, it will have some value, but may not be the great value that you are 
looking for. And also remember, we do have a, a offer for all of you, those who join the webinar, and I will be sharing that at the end of the webinar. I trust all of you know a little bit about Adaptive US. We are a very focused organization in terms of providing IIBA prep training courses. Uh, probably uh, for last three years, we would be rated number one, uh, given the fact that we have been able to collect the data. I don't see any of our competitors collecting the data, which is a bit surprising, but we have been very methodical uh, in kind of getting student data, student feedback. So we have an amazing uh, rating of 4.9 on Google reviews, if you go and see, and I think it's about 300 plus reviews now. Uh, and 1,900 plus certifications so far. We're hoping to achieve 2,000 certifications by this year end. And we have run IIB courses for 50 plus months uninterrupted. So no month we had a break uh, for last 50 plus months. I would say maybe it's more than 60 months now if I just have to take it. Uh, because from the beginning, when we promised to run the courses, we have been running the courses every month. I'll skip this one. So this is a question to you. Many of you may be studying Babok as I speak to you. Uh, how has been your experience with Babok? How do you find Babok? An interesting read, a difficult read? How has been? Juliet, how has been your experience with Babok? None of you have any experience with Babok? I would be surprised. Some of you must have started studying Babok, no? those of you who are planning to take any of the IIBA Babok. Oh, a lot of jargons to grasp. Okay, true. Um, Amir says it's interesting. I'm glad. Okay, Juliet says it's confusing. Uh, Luca says it's a bit abstract. It's a bit intimidating. Yeah, I, I, we get lots of interesting uh, comments. Okay. Uh, the Q&A is the way that you can interact with me. So once you put something in Q&A, I get to see it. I will answer it verbally. And maybe later on, uh, I will transcribe it as well. Uh, okay, Santil says he hasn't gone into it much. Difficult read. Uh, okay, Anand says he read it when he did not have. Somebody says, uh, uh, Abhay, I think Abby says, struggle to return information. Okay, good. All true. Uh, in fact, I remember a very interesting reply from one of our past students, which I still remember. Uh, so he told me, Ellen, the night I don't get sleep, uh, I open a Babok and I start reading. Okay. And I get nice sleep. So I, I remember that answer very well because I remember it's not a very interesting read for sure. It's not a novel. Uh, it's meant to be a lot of information, a lot of terminology uh, that has changed from V2 to V3. Uh, V2 was a lot more, uh, I would say, grounded in terms of terminology. So you hear the words like requirements quite a lot more compared to what you see in V3, which is business analysis information. So we wanted to be technically very correct. Uh, and that's why probably the nomenclature or the terminology changed. But that has been a hard change for many practitioners including me, because uh, I don't see such terms being used in the practice. Um, so that, that makes it harder for anyone to communicate. I'm hoping uh, in case we have a version four, maybe we will use terminology, which is more commonsensical and stakeholders can understand it better. That's a point uh, that I would definitely communicate to the Babok uh, authoring team. Okay. So anyway, let's go back and take a look at what is Babok as per Babok. No? So obviously it's an acronym for Business Analysis Body of Knowledge. And it says it contains description of generally accepted practices. That means what you do in the field of business analysis. Okay. And obviously it gives you a lot of ideas about skills that you should acquire as a business analyst, tasks that you should be able to perform, and techniques that you should know as a business analyst. So let me ask you another question here. I'll, I'll come back to this one. 
Uh, so those of you who have read Babok to some extent, uh, do you believe that it's a true business analysis guide? What is your opinion? Is it a true business analysis guide? Let me see. Yeah, many of you say yes, yes, yes. Okay, that's nice. And then says yes. Uh, Precious says not completely. Okay, to some extent. Okay, yes. Okay. So if you hear the word analysis, what does it mean? Analysis means analyzing something. So obviously, when we are looking at business analysis, we are trying to analyze a business. Hmm. So just wearing a little bit of a consulting hat, because that's how I started my business analyst journey. Uh, in my personal opinion, and I strongly vouch for it, a, a true BA guide should contain ways to analyze business performance. How is the business doing today? Is it doing well? Uh, how is the performance getting better, worse? Okay. It should also analyze impediments to achieve our business goals. So every business has a goal, has an objective. What are the impediments in our way to achieve them? Identify key risks to business. No, because businesses are constantly um, evolving, changing the, the context is changing periodically. And if businesses don't understand the risks and opportunities, both, no. So for example, if you see AI is causing a lot of disruption to businesses. So if you are a business uh, and maybe your business will go away, for example, think of call centers as a business. No? Call centers were such a large business segment 10, 15 years back. And I believe many of you might have heard the conversation on YouTube, you can go and search. Now, the Tesla AI bot talking to a customer, you will not be able to realize that, and the customer doesn't actually realize that customer was talking to a bot. Yeah. Okay. So look at that piece of the business world, which is call center. Uh, it's going to go away or it's going to get diminished significantly. Chat support. It's going to get diminished significantly. Okay, so a lot of businesses will see disruption because of AI, um, including I myself. You know? So people are saying that, Ellen, we can create a digital twin for you. Uh, it will talk like Ellen, it will answer like Ellen, uh, which is what I'm experimenting with. Uh, it also brings up a lot of opportunities for a company like ours, where Ellen can be present 24 by seven, answering questions in five different channels. Um, that's also a possibility, no? So it's a threat and it's a possibility or an opportunity as well. So this is what I truly believe a business analysis guide should be about. And Babok is very little of those aspects. So you must be wondering, how come we are calling something as a business analysis standard or a guide and it hardly covers the major parts of business analysis. So I'll tell you a little bit of history about uh, Babok and how did it evolve? So it actually evolved from the SDLC. Okay, so you must be thinking, how come the Babok evolved from SDLC and why from SDLC? So let's realize that in last 30 to 50 years time frame, the software as a business, software as a solution, has been gaining a lot more traction. No, you, you all see, you know, uh, in the past we had paper records and many of you might have seen paper records, ledgers, and I have, I have worked with clients who had only paper-based processes. Although those processes have really come down, but I've seen leave records on paper, bills on paper, everything was on paper. So obviously, a paper-based process is very expensive, difficult to maintain, difficult to find data. Then companies realize that here is something called a computer, and the computer has something called software, which can actually help maintain data. That's the evolution of software uh, as an industry. Of course, there are other parts of software industry, 
but a major part came from data and records management. So companies realized the power of software. They started creating a lot of software projects. And I believe many of you might have spent a good amount of time as a business analyst working in software projects. I did the same thing. Uh, so I think the, uh, the first uh, software project that I worked on inadvertently, I was not willing, I was not thinking it's a software thing, uh, but I actually wanted to help a client to improve their billing performance. And then I realized that the billing performance is low because it is manual. And I worked with a developer to build a solution for the client uh, without the client asking me, actually. It was like my own uh, volition that I went ahead and did it. But that made a huge difference to the client. We could improve our revenue efficiency by 40%, which is humongous. No, just two people uh, working in a company which has 800 people working. And we two people could modify a process and get 40% extra revenue for the client. So imagine the impact that we are creating. So I myself and my developer, we are almost representing like 400 people or maybe not 400, 250, 260 people in the system. So this is what happened universally, okay? So once the SDLCs came into being, uh, people thought of a way to structure software development. So they created something called SDLC. They put something called planning where they thought what they want to build. Okay. So maybe you are planning to build a CRM system, uh, a hospital management system, whatever, uh, inventory management system, whatever system you are interested in, you do some planning for building that system. Then they needed people who could actually understand the requirements, those need to be made or implemented in the software solution. So these people had some interaction with business because they would understand the needs from the business stakeholders and they will write these requirements in a way that the technical people, the software developers can understand. So essentially we were business requirements analysts. Okay, so what we are calling as BA, it's actually business requirements analysis, which is one type of business analysis. And I would say a pretty small segment of what you do or what you can do as business analysis. So this is the term uh, which became very popular in the industry. Uh, we were called business analyst, requirements analyst, software requirements analyst, and different agencies got involved in different parts of the story, like for planning, uh, PMI and Prince became very popular. So they created standards around project planning and monitoring. Uh, IIBA, BCS and IREB, including PMI, PMI also got into the BA space, uh, because you can see these are all part of SDLC, have a lot of close interactions. So PMI also got into this space, and these agencies decided that we will focus primarily on the requirements part of the story because requirements matter. You know? uh, poor requirements obviously will result in a poor product. There is no doubt about it. And that's how the whole species of business analysts were born. And I was also part of this. Uh, I did requirements analysis for two large ERP implementation projects. Uh, and that's how I got involved into teaching, consulting, writing about business analysis, because I wanted to focus on one thing. I knew planning as well, but I said, there are a lot of people doing planning area work. Let me focus on requirements. So now you get an idea that we are actually talking about primarily software requirements analysis. So keep this in mind. Babok is primarily about software requirements analysis. I know a lot of people will come back and say, Ellen, this is incorrect. We don't agree with you. Babok is generic. All kinds of arguments will be thrown. People who love Babok. I also love Babok. Uh, but it's not true. Because if it is not about software requirements analysis, what is UML doing there? Can you go to a, um, go to a factory or you go to a construction company and say, apply UML, what will they say? 
I actually got a request from a construction company saying that you come and teach us requirements analysis. I said, sorry, I'm not a good person because I don't have domain knowledge. And what I know is software requirements analysis, not your domain requirements analysis. Although requirements analysis has certain uh, commonalities across industry, but just that we are very focused on software requirements analysis. And then also remember that there are other kinds of analysis that you can do as a business analyst, which is business data analysis, uh, which is I think the predominant term uh, when people talk about business analyst, they're actually referring largely to business data analyst. I wish we put these middle words everywhere so that we don't create confusion in people's mind. Uh, and BDA has some similarity to business requirements analysis, but it's again a very different skill set. You need to know SQL, Power BI, Tableau, whatever. For requirements analysis, you probably need process modeling. MSVCO, different tools. No, the tool sets are not similar. The skills are also somewhat common because they all pertain to BA, but again, pretty much different. So keep this in mind. Now this will make you a lot easier to understand that we are talking about software requirements analysis. And then we take a look at the evolution of BABOC, which I think some of you might realize. So the first time the concept of BABOC came up, it was in 2004. So exactly 20 years back in 2005, version 1.0 was released, which I did not study. Uh, I actually studied the version 2.0 because I was planning to take the test in 2012. And then of course it got upgraded to 2015 version, which is what we are studying right now, which is version 3.0. But if you look at this time frame that we are talking about between 2005 to 2015, okay, uh, how many of you ran agile based project in those days, pre 2015? Anyone here who, who worked pre 2015 time frame, 2000, 2001, um, 2005? Uh, how many of you must have been working? No, I, I started working as an IT professional in 1992, uh, software professional from 1996. Okay. Anyone who worked in agile based projects? Sam says yes. Sentil uh, says yes, but as a QA. But mostly, yeah, agile 2008. In fact, if you look at the first discussion, major discussion on agile started in the year 2000. Okay, so by the time Agile became a little bit more mainstream, it was around 2010, 2012. But by that time, we already have published BABOC. No, BABOC 2.0 has been published. Uh, 3.0 work has been going on. So obviously, which approach the authors should have focused on? Would it be waterfall or would it be Agile approach? Which one? It's a very sensible question, no? We were in the waterfall world, no? So obviously, Babak is more waterfall is or agile? Okay, so I would say, remember Babak as a software application development project. So I can write it down here for your benefit. Uh, it's not letting me I'll write it down here. Uh, it's large application development, large software application development, not product development. Again, remember, products are a different ball game, and products have started evolving somewhat around 2010 onwards. So when I started as a business analyst role, we hardly talked of products. There were few products like SAP, Oracle, JD Edwards but very few in number. Then the internet happened and software as a service evolved. And that's what led to a lot of products coming in. But we were a little bit late and turned into the product game uh, as a Babok writing team because products were also not that popular. So most of the BAs worked in application development. Hence the focus remained on application development. 
Good. So, and then what I would also do for you is to explain you the Babok knowledge areas and how I have uh, reinterpreted them, you can say, or interpreted them in my own way and making it a little bit easier for me to understand and helping you to understand the knowledge areas better as well. So that's why you will see I have written it here as SRM box, Software Requirements Management Body of Knowledge. Um, so keep that in mind. Then the first knowledge area, although it says business analysis, planning and monitoring, when you go through it, you can very clearly see it's about requirements planning and monitoring. So whenever you hear this word business analysis, if you replace the word with requirements or requirements analysis, it will make a lot more sense to you. Then obviously the second knowledge area, it's pretty much obvious. I just have added the word requirements elicitation rather than just calling it as elicitation and stakeholder collaboration. Okay. Uh, so obviously uh, I would have put stakeholder collaboration in planning and monitoring. That's probably a better area to talk about planning, monitoring, uh, because as part of planning, we do stakeholder collaboration planning and we could do monitoring there as well. I have no idea why that was pushed into elicitation. Um, of course, maybe the thought process was most of the requirements get elicited from the stakeholders. And that's why stakeholder collaboration plays a very important role. But it actually plays a very important role throughout the project. So that part is fine. The third knowledge area, I have left it as it is, which is requirements lifecycle management, uh, which makes sense. The fourth knowledge area is where I had maximum difficulty because I came from a consulting background. And for us, whenever we talked of strategy, we generally refer to it as organizational strategy. Usually we did not talk so much about project strategy, although projects also can have a strategy. Uh, but BABOC is about more about requirements implementation strategy. And whenever BABOC uses the word strategy, you can actually replace that word with roadmap. Although I again differ on that aspect, that a strategy is a lot more than roadmap. It, it, it could have many other aspects. Roadmap is one aspect of strategy. But this is what we are actually doing in strategy analysis. And that's why a lot of people think, how come it is not the first one in the knowledge area? Because usually your initiatives will follow a strategy. But we are not talking about enterprise strategy at all. No, that's not the focus. The focus is we have the requirements in hand. How do we implement it? Do we implement it in a waterfallist way or in an agile manner? That's what is about knowledge area four. Knowledge area five, I have no problem. It's pretty much requirements analysis and design definition. The sixth knowledge area, again, is a little bit of a troublesome thing. Uh, remember, it is not solution selection evaluation. It's solution performance evaluation. How is the solution performing? Uh, and maybe a set of solutions, not only one solution. And what can we do to improve their performance? So I would always recommend keep this snapshot with you. This is going to be very helpful when you are trying to navigate through that uh, You will also see we made a very nice mind map of all the 30 tasks in BABA. Uh, and we did give a number to it, if you can see here. Um, and But remember, as per BABA, these tasks are not necessarily linear. They can repeat and they can revert. And also remember that the solution evaluation can be the very first starting point for you or the very last. Like if you are looking at a newly developed solution, then it automatically becomes the last because the solution has to be available to evaluate its performance. Whereas we could also start with an exercise, which we did with one of our clients, where suppose they have 150 applications. So you could actually evaluate these 150 applications to see uh, how are these applications performing? Are they doing well, not doing well? 
uh, which applications can be merged, which applications can be uh, kind of um, uh, sunset. Like I remember uh, uh, one time I used to be in Infosys and at that point in time, we had eight issue trackers. So there was an issue tracker for HR, there was an issue tracker for IT, there was an issue tracker for facilities. So each department had created one, one issue tracker. Then our CEO at that time, uh, he looked at this issue trackers and they said, all of you are doing issue tracking. Why eight applications? Why can't you merge into one? That way your cost of developing and maintaining the solution actually comes down. Uh, so I remember that example very well. And that was a very precise activity that the CEO did in terms of evaluating the application portfolio. Uh, then again, you will also find an interesting mind map that we created for techniques as well. And we intended to align techniques to knowledge areas, which is not the case with Babok, because what we believe is that certain techniques contribute significantly more towards a particular knowledge area. So in general, if you're getting questions on a particular technique, uh, this mind map can be very helpful, whether you will use the technique in this knowledge area or in some other task. Like, so for example, data modeling, process modeling, this typically would fall into requirements analysis knowledge area. Uh, I just will take two more minutes to tell you a little bit about adaptive, then I'll be open to take your question. As an organization, we exist to help you to achieve your career dreams. Uh, our focus has been to build high quality content. We have been spending almost eight years in all kind of a pretty big team in terms of developing content, updating the content. Uh, we are very selective about the type of trainers and mentors that you get. Uh, I'm pretty happy that the approach that we have taken has really given us good results. Uh, and that's what has made us almost the number one in this particular page. Again, we have three nice guarantees to back you up. Uh, and these are financial guarantees. So it's not like a paper guarantee uh, in case something goes wrong with you and you have followed our guidance. We are going to pay your retake fees from our pocket. So those are covered from the company's side. Uh, so these are the kind of people that you will meet during our programs. Uh, Laura Patton is on a sabbatical. So we have got one more uh, lady, Olivia Hampton, joining us in her place. Um, so otherwise, we are a very small select set of trainers. Uh, Victoria has been an amazing person. He is also on the board of uh, IIBA currently. He, she was previously the regional director for Europe, uh, but now she is the, uh, she is a board member for IIBA as well. Lots of stories that you can read about us. Um, here is an interesting link. I would always recommend those of you who are planning to go for IAB certifications, you get a nice book with lots of questions, tips about IIBA certifications. And there are a lot more resources if you go to this uh, LMS portal from us as well. Uh, so please take a note of the webinar coupon. Uh, it's ADA Web 2409. Um, so you can ask whenever you are enrolling for a course, you can give this code and that will automatically allow our CS folks to extend your access by a month without any extra payment. Good, that's about it. And I trust I took about 35 minutes. Uh, my target was 30 minutes, so it, it's okay. Um, so uh, it's your time now, so you can go ahead and um, um, ask your questions now. If you have any questions on Babok, IIB certifications, um, you can ask your questions now. I see someone raising the hand. Let me see, how do I see that? Uh, the best way to, okay. Okay, so Sam has asked how many hours to certification. It depends on the certification that you are taking. Usually for ECBA, 
you take about 60 hours of preparation post training. Uh, for CCBA, you will need 80 to 90 hours. For CBAP, you will take somewhere between 100 to 120 hours because CBAP uh, is the uh, most difficult one uh, to complete. Uh, Alok has a question saying how to prepare for CBAP. Uh, I can do one thing. We do have, uh, oh, Alok is already ECBA certified. Good to know, Alok. Uh, so since you are already a bit familiar with BABOC, essentially prepare for more complex questions, uh, which is the scenario-based questions and case-type questions. Um, so that's what you should prepare for. Because for ECBA, you prepared with the simplest level of complexity and don't expect similar questions in CCBA or CBAP. I would also encourage you to take CCBA first before you take CBAP. It's, it's always good to take a graded step uh, because that makes you more confident, more prepared as well. Okay, it might cost you a little bit of more money, uh, but taking that graded approach is always good. Uh, so one of you is anonymous. I really don't know who are you, uh, but the question is, suggest the best approach to using or reviewing the BABOC. Uh, you can take two approaches. Uh, one um, is you read through BABOC, make your own notes. That's what I do. So whenever I go for a new exam, uh, I read through the study guide or the guide given by the standard body and make my own notes. That's one approach. Uh, the second approach is you could take a look at our study guide, uh, which is a much more compact version of BABA. Okay, so you could use that to understand BABA pretty well, and then you can go back to BABA and read it. It becomes a lot easier for you to understand BABA. Uh, so, June has asked, can you share the free bonus website? Uh, okay, so is this what you are referring to, June? I would trust so. Uh, it's thinkific.adaptiveus.com. That's our learning portal. Okay. Uh, Alok, uh, the works history part, we do guide students when they go through the training. Uh, there is a template that we have designed that's available to our students. Uh, it's pretty much self-explained. So if you look through the template, it will guide you how to fill up work history for CBAP. Uh, Juliet is asking, what is the cost of CBAP certification preparation? Uh, we have three products in that CBAP certification. Uh, the lowest one starts at $400. Uh, that's mostly our study guide, question bank, and simulations. Uh, then you can get an extra support from faculty members uh, that comes at about, I think, $700, if I'm right. Uh, but please check the website. I may be wrong as well. And then there is a product at $949, uh, which comprises of the content, plus uh, 32 hours of teaching, plus 12 office hours as well. So that's the most comprehensive product that we have. You can also buy exam voucher through us. Uh, and when you buy the exam voucher through us, you do get a little discount on the exam fee as well. So if you buy directly from IIBA, it comes to you at some cost. Uh, with us, you get probably about $80 off on your IIBA exam fees. Uh, but that you get that benefit when you are a student. Okay, then uh, Aramide has a question. Uh, the study guide is part of our self-learning product. So if you want to access the study guide, the self-learning product will give you that. Along with that, it will also give you uh, past lectures, the video recordings, question bank, everything comes together. Uh, ah, Hurong has a good question. Uh, if you are already coming from a business background, uh, you need to understand bit of technology, which we do cover in the program as well. Uh, some bit of understanding in terms of data structures, data models, um, program flow. So these are things that you need to learn uh, because usually developers need help at that level. Like how do you define proper user interface requirements? 
so we do use a technique called extended data matrix, uh, which is something based on data dictionary from uh, the Babok, but we extended it further. Um, so you to learn these techniques, learn these techniques that will help you to communicate better with your developers. That's a journey. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, but what benefit you get by going through a structured program is what would have taken you about a two years time frame to learn. Uh, maybe you can learn it in three months. Um, Alok has a question. How does Babok audit work history? Uh, it's their prerogative. Um, if they perceive that your work history may not be right, uh, they may ask for references. Think that are there two independent people who could vouch for your work? Hmm. Uh, Amir has a question. Affiliated exam centers in Odisha. I really doubt. Uh, I mean, all major cities it is there, but I don't think you'll find it in Odisha. Uh, maybe you can take it virtually as well. Uh, all the exams you can take it virtually. There is no problem. Uh, but if you have an exam center nearby, uh, I would always recommend you go to the exam center. Hmm. Uh, Steve says, I'll just join. Yeah, we will share the recording. Don't worry so much about it. Um, oh, okay. Again, one more question from anonymous attendee. Are there sections of the Babok you need to memorize? Uh, no. Uh, usually we don't focus on memorization. That's a bad approach. Uh, we rather focus on understanding the concepts. And for ECBA, you may expect some direct questions, but not for CCBA and CBA. Hmm. Uh, Linda has a question saying, how often we offer adaptive live classes in Australia every month? Okay. Uh, so we do two sessions, one for the North American and the European region, one for the Asian and Australian region. Uh, so Lucas has a question, what type of questions are the hardest? Obviously the case type questions, uh, because the case type questions are quite long, uh, they're difficult, they're, they involve diagrams, they involve computation, so obviously they are the hardest. Uh, okay, Steve again has asked the coupon thing. So I'm just showing you the coupon slide as well. Uh, okay, Anand has a question, which one is better? Uh, people take both on-demand program, they take live classes as well. Um, the advantage with on-demand is it's much cheaper compared to the live classes. But usually people who take live classes complete the certification much faster. No, because that kind of keeps a momentum. You have a program running, you have to attend the program, you have to go with the faculty. So obviously, in general, people tend to complete uh, certification in about six months earlier uh, in the live program compared to on demand. So that's the major difference in terms of how much time you take to complete your certification. And also remember, the later you get certified, the benefits also come to you later. So if you get certified earlier, you can take advantage of the certifications earlier, no? So for example, I'll just give you an example of adaptive. Uh, when we started uh, adaptive, there were many companies which were much older than us in this space. So how do we compete with them? Because these companies are already established. They have good customer base. So IIBA came up with this certification called ECBA. And we were the first company in the world to launch ECBA training compared to others. So other companies took maybe six months more uh, than us. And because we were the first company to offer ECBA training, people who were looking for ECBA training, they had no choice, only adaptive. And that's how we made our name because others were simply not offering. Similarly, uh, if you are certified, you generally get tend to be picked up a little earlier compared to those who are not certified. Not only the branding part, of course, there is a branding part. Also remember, 
by going through a structured program, your skills and knowledge also become a lot more clearer. You understand the topic much better than what you would have done it yourself. Uh, then let me look at Senfield's question. Uh, job change from a QA to be a role. A uh, personal interest in a be a role. Okay, very good. Um, Senfield, um, see, certification does not replace experience and experience does not replace certification. These are two independent factors. Somebody with experience and certification will beat somebody without experience and certification. But usually when a comparison is being made, people who have done certification tend to do well in terms of resume screening. Because you are getting a certificate saying that you have understood the subject and that works like a validation. No, the experience is not validated unless the company does an interview for you and you simply may not reach the interview stage. Okay, Anand has a question. Yeah, we are one of the good providers in the world, I would say among the top three for sure. Uh, and it's hard for me to comment on others' courses because I'm not a privy to their courses. But in general, uh, our courses are pretty well done, well made. Our support is pretty good. And that's what has made it so many students complete ECBA, CCBA, CBAP with us. It's 1900 plus now. It's not a small number. Um, yeah, one of you have asked, is ECBA, CBAP well recognized in Australia, New Zealand, Singapore? For sure. The only place where uh, IIBA certifications get a little bit of competition, good competition, is UK. No. UK has BCS and BCS is a government body in UK. Uh, so a lot of government organizations will go with BCS. Uh, but other than UK and to some extent Germany, um, rest all countries, I think IIBA certifications are very well recognized. Okay. Uh, yes, if you took the exam four to five years ago and you did not complete the exam, there is no other choice. Okay, you have to take the exam to complete your CBAP. Uh, okay, who should be one to provide technical solution? It depends. Uh, usually technical solutions come from the technology team. So if you have a solution architect, so as a business analyst, our primary role is to provide proper requirements. That's what is our role about. No. To understand the business needs, uh, describe all the functional requirements very well, uh, deliberate on the non-functional requirements, provide the non-functional requirements to business. No? Because sometimes people miss requirements. And just to give you an example, in one of my past projects, when I was not trained, but I was working as a BA, and say 25 years back, there was hardly anything for BAs, no? Even our role does not exist. Our designation did not exist. Um, so I missed a non-functional requirement while writing the requirement spec. Um, for that missed requirement, the client had to suffer a loss of six million dollars. One missed requirement resulted in such a huge loss. I still did not get fired because in those days, people understood software much, much less. And because this was a $400 million project, the $6 million we could observe no, because it's a large project. But imagine if your project was only $12, $13 million, and you lost $6 million in one requirement, the project would have been abandoned actually. But I still feel very bad about what I did um, because, because of lack of my skills, the client had to suffer, which is not a good thing. Okay. Uh, we are not on Udemy, okay? 
how much is our question bank again we don't sell question bank independently uh, the basic package that we have is the self paced learning uh, that comes with study guide question bank video learning everything hmm. we don't sell independent small pieces uh, laura says yeah okay yeah i think laura i answered your question you have to take cbap certification if you wish to um, I know I have to take the retake the exam. I'm asking if you have to fill up all the documentation. Of course, Laura, but the documentation has become a little easier now. I remember uh, maybe you had taken it in V2 uh, and the documentation was pretty bad in those days. Um, so now it's much, much simpler compared to uh, there. Is CVAP recertification an exam, Juliet? No. CVAP recertification is not an exam. Uh, it's more of a subscription renewal with certain proof to be given to IIBA that you are still working as a VA. Uh, Laura, we will guide you, help you. Don't worry. Uh, don't have that frightening mindset. I know you're coming from V2 perspective when it was very, very hard. V3 is a lot simpler. Uh, Senthil says, and usually Santali does not ask for a verification of how many hours, but it mostly looks for, do you have uh, about two and a half years of business analysis experience? That's what it is looking for. And trust me, many QA folks already are doing good amount of BA work. Trust me, take me because BAs do some amount of testing. Testing people also do some amount of VA work. So if you have been working as a QA for more than five, six years, uh, you probably would qualify for CCBA. That's my hunch, uh, but we still need to take a detailed look at your work profile. Uh, Laura, I have. Uh, Giridhan says, do you have an offline class in Bangalore? No. Uh, we do uh, in-person sessions, but for corporates. Uh, and we can do corporate training in the US, in the Europe, in the Australian region, Asian region, but that has to be a corporate session, not an individual session. Okay, okay, that's about it then. Good, any last question? Because we still have five minutes. Uh, maybe I can answer a couple of questions before we wind up. No? Okay. Uh, just to give you an update from IIBA, which I received today, uh, there is a 15% off on IIBA exam fees. Uh, if you file the exam or take the exam, I'm not very sure, but there is a 15% off on IIBA exam fees till 30th September. So that's an, that's an information that you can use uh, for your benefit. Okay. Alok says, want to join for SIPA? For sure. Welcome. That's it then. Uh, okay. Thank you, folks, for joining us today. Uh, I'm glad you could spend some time, and I hope I answered most of your questions. If there's still um, some questions uh, unanswered, please write to me. Uh, Senthil says, will CPOA supplement a BA role? For sure. Uh, CPOA is more for product environment. See, I have been telling, no, Babok is more for a project environment or an application environment. Uh, product ownership is more towards product development, although you can use the concepts for application development as well. Uh, but CPOA is more focused towards agile way of working, not the waterfall way of working. So I study all the standards more like an uh, information uh, source, and I utilize whatever I find good in them. Okay. Uh, so CPOA has some good content. Agile analysis certification has some very interesting concepts. Um, so read them, more like a knowledge source for you. And I would always encourage all of you to become a member of IIBA. It's a great community to be part of. Uh, you get a lot of discounts on your exam fees, uh, lots of resources as well. Uh, it, it's good to be a part of IIBA network as well. Okay, yeah, okay. 
thank you giri and thank you all for joining us today and have a lovely day lovely evening a lovely afternoon depending on where you are and i hope to see some of you in our programs if not you can still stay in touch with me on linkedin uh, if you search for ellen mishra siba uh, you should be able to find me on linkedin as well okay thank you bye bye